Well, um, we're going to get started with today's um, Career Pathway User Group meeting for um, Friday the 13th in October. Um, that one's always a fun one, I think, when uh, people are thinking about superstition and all the great um, uh, holiday activities coming up. Um, uh, for our agenda today, we, we are going to be talking about a few different topics. Um, really, the, the top two is that IWAS update that Heather Lucan is going to provide for us on um, what is happening uh, with IWAS and, and how that's going to impact um, your ability to be submitting your applications. Uh, we have an update on some of the endorsement data, and then we're going to be discussing today the intensive career exploration um, component of the uh, career pathway endorsement. And so um, as you're going through, um, uh, at the end, you, you want to take that evaluation um, so that we have some feedback on that as well. So with our um, welcome and introductions, my name is Bill Rose. I am with the NIU Illinois CTE project in collaboration with ISBE. Um, you'll notice um, a, a few of our team members are uh, here as well. Um, and, and so what we do is we collaborate with ISBE on this work with the Career Pathway User Group and multiple other um, as needed directives from ISBE. So um, I'm going to uh, send it over to Heather to give her introduction and then uh, Jason. Sure. Uh, morning, everyone. Heather Lucan with Illinois State Board of Education. Um, I'm a principal consultant with CTE. I oversee school counselors across the state, and I'm responsible for the arts and communications uh, endorsement area. Uh, and let's say I've been at ISBE for five years now, coming up to five years. And um, yeah, I pretty much do all things CCBE <laughs> and CCRI. So uh, this user group has been fantastic for a way for us to, to keep tabs on everything and your needs and, and your requests and, and provide updates. So looking forward to our meeting today. And good morning, everybody. My name is Jason Klein, Senior Director of Learning Partnerships at NIU. It is homecoming week at NIU, and it is the 116th homecoming, which is the oldest of the universities in Illinois. And so I called out a different background today. I hope that's okay. It's going off script here for our normal career connected Illinois background. Um, and just a call out to everybody on the call who's doing the work. Uh, I, early this morning, ran into a superintendent of a high school district while walking our dogs uh, very early this morning in the dark. And we had a whole conversation about the CCRIs. And so again, it's, it's really good work that's happening. And um, again, this is a district that historically would maybe not have been focused on some of, some of the work that everybody in this room is doing now. And it's really exciting with the impact and the potential it has for all students. And I see someone just popped in who uh, has that district in her region. So there we go. Exciting stuff. Bill? Yeah, so we're going to talk real briefly on the uh, purpose of the Career Pathway User Group. And really what this is about is the user group is a group of people who are interested in the particular area or use of the same product who use the internet to share information about it. And, and kind of um, in plain term is it's a group where we are sharing information using the Google um, group app kind of uh, from, from Google and, and interacting in a way that um, supports each other. And so uh, we highly encourage people to ask questions in the group. Uh, if you have something that's coming up like a special event and you wanna share that um, on how you're trying to implement that. Um, if you have suggestions for people, or just really kind of any information around um, the career pathways, um, we encourage people to really use that um, application and, and share that information within the group. Okay. And it, it, uh, again, so that vision of the College and Career Pathway endorsement um, is of quality for individual st students ra rather than quantity. Um, and we really focus in on that, um, that quality component. 
Um, you know, I, I think it was at one point uh, we were talking with business leaders who um, were saying, you know, um, if I hire someone with the endorsement, I want to see um, a difference in that in that student or that that uh, graduate. And so that whole component of quality is really important to this group. And we just really want to stress that um, importance of that authenticity uh, as we get through um, those career pathway endorsement um, uh, initiatives as we're implementing them in our programs. So we're going to get into some quick announcements. Um, one is the ISBE Career Connected Illinois professional calendar is available for you to take a look at. Um, one, one quick call out in that calendar is there is a new um, uh, professional development that is coming October 24th. Um, it's related to the business and finance uh, pathway. And so um, this is one where they're assessing the essential skills in the business and finance services career pathway. And so um, we're gonna be um, adding some new ones per pathway. So we wanted to give that specific call out as um, a way for, um, if you have a specific pathway in your district or school, um, there will be some um, specific essential skills uh, workshops that will be added to the calendar. So you, you wanna check in on that calendar and uh, see if um, there's one that applies to your school. Also, we have a call for proposals coming up uh, for the ISBE Career Connections Conference. If you don't have this in your calendars, uh, you want to add this to your calendar for June 18th at Tinley Park Convocation or Co Convention Center. Uh, but we are going to be sending out a uh, call for proposals. And so if you know anyone who does really um, something fantastic, something interesting in their classroom, this um, uh, Connections Conference is really teacher centric. It's uh, teacher focused. And so um, that call for proposals uh, will be coming soon as a part of uh, the conference. And so now we're going to get into our career pathway endorsement data, and I'm going to turn it over to Heather to start um, that conversation. Thanks, Bill. So I'm very, very happy to give our final numbers for 22-23. We had 1,072 students that received endorsements uh, in, in FY23. Um, and I think that if we, if we move to that next slide, I think it's the next one. Yeah, you can see, well, okay, we'll, we'll do this one first. So there are currently, and as of this morning, actually it's now 223 school districts that have access to the PWR platform, um, meaning that they're starting to build their plans. And obviously they're at all stages of when they're going to offer those or implement those. Some just want their plans to be approved so they can have those um, and are, maybe they'll start implementing or offering those officially in a few years, but they want to make sure that they have all the required components. So that's very exciting. I still continue to get, obviously, new requests for access to the platform. So that's, that's a, a new number for us. Yep. And then um, this goes along with the FY23 data. So we have 39 school districts that um, had students that received endorsements. So I, I wanna call something out on this too. So even though it, it may seem, okay, 39 districts, there were a lot more districts than that. I want to say probably, and I should have looked at that data this morning, I apologize for that, probably 15 to 20 additional districts that had approved plans. They just did not have students that were eligible to receive the endorsements. So that's a, a, a number. So when you see the 39 school districts, those are the 39 that had students of those 1,072 students that had students that, that received endorsements last year. Um, so that is still an increase um, from what we've had before. I expect that number to rise even more so this year uh, based on um, the information that I've gotten and the request from the district saying, hey, we're ready for 24. So, uh, you know, let's get the plan going. Um, so just just again, there's that key word, even even in the House bill, it is 
offer that endorsement to the graduating students, um, fully recognizing that some years it's going to rise and fall based on the interests of the students and based on the criteria. They may not meet all the criteria. So um, that's just something to, to pay attention to when we're looking at um, the number of districts that actually have approved plans. Okay. And then this, and I know Jason was gonna jump in a little bit on this one too, because I know he put this graph together for us, but this just shows you that disbursement across the years um, for how many endorsements, and you can see that rise again, um, that we have all seven career pathways and multidisciplinary this um, past year for students that receive the endorsements. So a couple of things, yeah, we, we've, we're following the same pattern um, you know, pattern is kind of a funny word to use because um, it wasn't really until 22 and 23, and I, I say until, and this is still, let me stress, from a, for those that have studied educational policy implementation, this is happening very, very quickly, and so uh, it's happening even more quickly when we consider uh, what school districts have been dealing with since the 2019-2020 mm -hmm. school year, so um, but but the pattern, there is a pattern that is a, has emerged at this point um, over the past couple of years. I anticipate, based on working with people by and large, that in a lot of ways, this pattern will stay the same. Um, it, I have a couple of ideas in my own head of where I expect to see shifts in this pattern over the next three or four years. I'm going to keep those to myself at mm -hmm. the moment. But um, the other thing that, that we've started doing is, uh, and I know the agency will be also doing this uh, separately together and, and probably in parallel, all three, uh, but doing some additional analysis. So I can tell everybody, for example, last weekend, I've already done an analysis of um, endorsement, uh, issued endorsements by school district based on percentage of students whose families are considered low income and based on school district adequacy level in comparison to other districts around the state. There's a lot more we can do with that. One of the things that, well, well, we're not sharing all that data today. Maybe we will at some point. There's some interesting stuff to look at there. Um, one of the things I will call out is the range on both of those um, was uh, extraordinary. I mean, the, the range on I mean, percent adequacy level, if you don't know, part of the evidence-based funding that's been in place the last five or six years in Illinois is the state now does set an adequacy target based on a formula of who your community is and who your students are and how much money it would take to give them an effective education. Um, schools really don't have to be funded at 100% of that adequacy level, even though 100% is what defines adequacy. Uh, I wrote a little paper on this about 20 years ago. And uh, so this is funny because the goal is to fund them at 90% of adequacy level, which is actually inadequate. That's another story for an evidence-based funding conversation. Um, the but the adequacy level shows the percentage of a school district's targeted adequacy level based on students and communities. And like our range there is we have school districts in the low 60s, which is is very low. You you do not have enough money to adequately support your students and their needs um, to school districts that were at 120 percent. But if you think all of the districts um, that are issuing endorsements are in the 100 to 120% range, that is, is not the case at all, as a matter of fact. And so we have a very wide range. And the average, the mean among the 39 districts um, was um, 83%, whereas the state's mean is about 71%. So these districts do have more money. Um, and so, so there's that. I see there's a question about the multidisciplinary endorsement. That's probably a whole nother conversation for another day. We've got a lot packed in that we know people need to know about. So we, we may come back to that. And as we talk about the rules in the next few minutes, uh, maybe I'll point to the fact that the rules will provide a lot more clarity on multidisciplinary. So I'm going to kick it back to Heather now. Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right. So um, updating on the Iowa. So I just want to let you know that um, yesterday and even last week, last week was my first um, opportunity to go in and, and truly test the entire system. And yesterday uh, we had another meeting regarding that. And, 
And um, we had some language changes in there to make sure that it was in alignment with the required components, as well as ease of use for all of you when it comes time to um, transfer your plan into Iowa's. So we are, are testing that. We had some additional um, information that we wanted to have changed, um, <clears throat> some things regarding the course sequence in particular, uh, a way to capture those you know, it's the two two years or four semesters. However, we have had allowances for those students that are going to a career center, and they may be taking two semesters worth of courses that are extended time, extended periods, and so that would co uh, count towards the the two two years four semesters. So we're finding a way to make sure that they, that can be entered appropriately and validated. Um, um, but it, it's functioning very well, so I'm very happy with that. Um, it, okay, if you go on to the next one, I think, though. So. Yeah, so when, when it comes to, I get this question a lot, especially with those, like, the past five or five to ten districts that have signed up, they, before even sending in their application, they'll send me an email and say, are you sure we should sign up? Because maybe we should wait for I was to open. I am going to say the same thing. Do not wait. If you uh, intend to, especially if you intend to issue endorsements for FY24, but even for 25 and beyond, please get access to the PWR plan or the PWR platform so that you can start to build your plans. I intend to, um, for those submissions, that plan approval form, that has to come in by December 15th in order to issue endorsements for 24. Um, and so I'm going to review those plans in the PWR system because there is going to be um, some time to transfer that information. So I don't want to wait for it to transfer and so forth. So please make sure that you're following that process as well and get, and get that into the PWR platform. Um, and um, I know that um, I have already already have some districts that have issued their approval form. And so my uh, schedule next week, I, I literally have three days blocked off and that's all I'm doing <laughs> is reviewing plans. So I'm getting that caught up because I know I'm gonna have more coming in. So I just want you to know that um, the, I know it's no later than February 28th. I really would love to have everything done, especially for those that are coming in right at December 15th or close to that by the end of December so that you're starting off your new year with the plans approved or any, um, any changes that need to, need to be made. Um, but there'll be more training on IWAS once that opens up. Um, uh, the current users, um, of the PWR platform will have access to I was before everyone else because you will need to transfer your information into that. And then what we're looking at is for the 24 and 25 school year that will open up um, um, to everyone because they will have to make that decision within 24, 25 school year. They'll have to make the decision as to whether or not they're going to issue pathway endorsements or opt out. So that's just kind of an overview um, of that. And I think that's what I'm, yeah. Um, okay, so yep, I would, I would say January 1st, 2024, that, that would be at a, a approximate date for opening that. Again, I want to make sure that it is functioning as best as it possibly can, knowing that there still could be hiccups once it opens up and, and you guys all start to enter your information, but we're that's why we're testing it so thoroughly to, to hope that that's not going to be an issue at all. Um, and as far as responsibility for putting that information into Iowa's, um, each district will need to, um, put that information in. I know we've had questions about the multiple accounts with one email, particularly for the CCPE coordinators and how that's gonna look to be able to have access to. So we're working with the SIS team on that and the IWAS team on that to find out how that can be set up um, to see what the, the best option is for that. Um, if you can create multiple accounts with that one email, which would tie you to those particular districts. Obviously, superintendents are going to be the ones that have to give approval to anyone within the district to use um, the CCP application in Iowa's. If I can jump in and just add one kind of expectation setting thing for sure. everybody there. Um, for those of you who are in that situation, like a CCPE coordinator or a, a, an EFE director, for example, area career center leader, um, 
do not expect that and that to necessarily be resolved one way or the other when the system opens, I, I would just say. So it may be, but that would be a bonus if it's resolved, even if it's not the answer we want. I, I would expect that to be after the system opens, then that piece really can get unpacked and looked at. So just trying to level set expectations because we know we have a lot of you, you're very important in this work regionally, um, but that that is a hurdle and the system was built around school districts and, and ultimately, as the last item says, each district will need to update uh, its own information in IWAS. Yeah, thanks Jason. So advantages of moving this, even though uh, you may say to yourself, and, and I'm, I'm probably, you may have said it to me as well, um, but now we have to transfer everything that we built into this new system. But I will say, given, given that I've been working over the past uh, two weeks to clean up the PWR platform and, and get, we've had some issues with access levels and so forth as far as um, the invites and, and districts inviting people and not getting the official invite from ISB and all that type of thing, this will eliminate all of that. Um, so it'll be direct access to that. The universities and colleges, as you know, in, in the system, um, if you don't go in and check to see if that's already been built, then we have multiple examples and multiple entries of the same community college with a different name, but then programs tied to it. And it's it's a bit of a headache. So this will eliminate a lot of that um, so that you have drop downs for a wide variety of these components where it's, it's almost direct responses. So it's forced response, so to speak, where uh, you can only choose from what is there. And, um, and the, but the key component too, as well as that, is that the data analysis will be streamlined. So we can run reports from this. We can have all that information. It'll be much easier to, to function on that end. Um, Heather, did you see the question in the chat? Yes, the I oh, did. Man. I did. Um, I'm not sure that the new, the program of study approval, Amy, um, would be linked with the CCPE approvals. I mean, if you're talking about having some type of, of way to enter that into IWAS, that's something that we are exploring, but those are two different submissions and different requirements for that. Um, and then districts without according outside of so this meeting. Can I, can I jump yeah. in on that second part? Sure. So Amy, our position as the NIU Illinois CTE project team would be that we assume because this is district level work that the college and career pathway endorsement application process is, our assumption is that no one has a CCPE coordinator in how we try to provide information. So these meetings, P20 network newsletters, when there's like key updates, pointing people back to ISB. And so and now obviously when there are CCP coordinators, they're also getting this information and they can pay a little more attention to this. So that's a big help. Um, but we try to work from that standpoint of um, no one no one knows anything about this unless we say it a whole lot of times. And then hopefully, hopefully people in a bunch of different ways, excuse me. And then yeah. hopefully people will know about it. Um, and I, I will so. say too, Jason, on, on uh, along with that, um, I do have a list, and this is what, uh, one of the things that I've sent out to the district contacts, which is why it's so important to make sure that those district contacts are correct. I have reached out to a few districts this year when some of those emails have bounced back to me. So I send out um, messages to all of the district contacts whenever there is something new that is happening or updates to anything, including the information um, regarding um, the approval process and so forth. That was an email that got sent out to all the district contacts. So, um, and that's something that once this gets moved into Iowa's again, then they'll have the opportunity to identify that district contact. And we will be able to then have that instead of me copying, pasting everyone's uh, 223 emails <laughs> into, into one, um, we'll have that information as well. Um, oh, yep, there is going to be a webinar on um, how iOS functions and how to access that and how to um, 
take a look at, uh, well, actually it's gonna be a walkthrough, exactly like what we currently have on the, on the website now with the walkthrough of the PWR platform. So you'll have a guidance document that explains all the different components and a step-by-step -step process, a guide and a video. And that is coming soon. As soon as um, we have all the language changes done in the IWAS, then I'm, I've already started to build that guidebook for everyone, but I just need it to be updated obviously so that it truly reflects what it's gonna look like when to, once you pop into IWAS. And, and Heather, just so people are aware, those resources are available for the current system right now, uh, right. which are on the website. So um, if you need a walkthrough or a, gui a guidebook or a video, those are available. Um, and so um, uh, Heather wanted us to, to be sure that those same resources would be available for Iowa's. All right, so we're going to get into a deeper dive into the component of the uh, um, uh, career pathway endorsement known as the intensive career ex exploration experience. And so we have some examples of those um, that we wanted to share and just kind of get a conversation going on what these look like and um, what are some of the ones that are happening throughout the state um, so that they can be copied or, or reproduced or even made better in some instances um, as we get to this. So um, I'm going to allow um, uh, Heather to address the definition and rulemaking here because I think this is a real um, important component as, as this moves forward. Right. So when you look at the rules um, that, again, I know that Bill's got this outlined on here. Um, we're hoping that uh, October 18th is when the board will approve those rules and then put them out for public comment. So as soon as that happens and we have that information, we will get that out to you so that you know how to handle that process and where you need to go to make those comments and so forth. Um, but when it comes to the career exploration, uh, it, it specifically lists that you are to have two career exploration activities or one intensive career exploration. And there has been a little bit of, uh, well, quite a few questions regarding clarifying that and what that actually means to be an intensive career exploration. So um, I, I know that um, when talking to districts and they're they're putting in their plans and so forth when we talk about intensive we're talking about uh, a one day um, event or something along those lines that is specific to the career pathway. So we know that within the work-based learning continuum, you have your career awareness and then your career exploration, and that takes it a step higher. So career awareness truly is, even though we're allowing these for, for career exploration, is, is like a career fair where you're going around to multiple careers and you're, you're, um, you're having those interactions and that's fantastic. And obviously as a counselor, we encourage Encourage that we want them to have that. Um, we have said within the career exploration activities, if you're going to use a career fair, you need to ensure that the students are uh, reflecting on those conversations. They are um, discussing afterwards um, with the, someone or even you know writing it down which career appealed to them and so forth. And you can use one of those as your career exploration. So we're allowing that. Um, but when we talk about an intensive um, opportunity, it really needs to be specifically aligned to that career pathway. So, um, and we've got some examples, yep, and definition. So when we look at the, a definition of what that intensive career exploration would be, um, it's no less than three hours. We're, we're talking about like a, a booth fair. So um, like manufacturing, I know that they have these, the manufacturings, they, they bring in teams for all the different uh, manufacturing opportunities. And that is the focus of that day. A college fair, again, that's career specific, job shadowing or a mini internship. And Things that really wouldn't count would be uh, a job fair where you're playing for a job and it's not career specific or just a, a short experience that you would have uh, mentoring experiences or a classroom speaker that would not count as intensive it, is it going to count for a career exploration yes it can um, mock interviews same thing um, so that's just um, more explanation as to as to what that is yeah, and I think um, one way to, to kind of call these out when I think about these types of events is that, like, for example, you know, um, if I'm going to the job fair, is it specific to the career pathway that the students are in, right? Mm -hmm. if, if I'm going to uh, take healthcare students 
to a job fair that um, that in order for it to to meet that intensive component, there should be, be some work ahead of time. There should be, um, you know, it should be medical related to the to the careers in that pathway. Um, there would be a reflection component, you know, and so um, I think um, in, in these examples, it's really um, simple to, to kind of see how it, it has to really be linked to that um, career pathway. Correct. So we're going to um, give some more information uh, to come as those rules are developed. Um, Heather had had mentioned that date here in October where ISB will be meeting. And as soon as we um, hear about um, what is the result of that meeting, we will be communicating the, um, the, the comments time for anyone who would like to make comments in regards to that. Uh, to those decisions. And so we'll be putting that into the uh, Career Pathway user group and some of our weekly messages and communicating that out so that um, if, if people want to participate in that comments uh, portion of the, the work that they can do that. We also wanted to share a few examples of these and what they look like in practice right now, which I think is really important because these examples um, while they're just examples that are, are currently occurring, um, there are ones that um, are really hitting that, that point where they are connected to that career pathway and allow for students to really kind of um, think about, you know, is this the right career pathway for me or is this something that um, uh, I need to, you know, kind of rethink that um, kind of uh, the job uh, path that I that I want to take. And so uh, we had three examples for the health sciences and technology, manufacturing, engineering, technology and trades, and human and public service. So the first one um, was one that um, one that I, I've done in the past in my experience. Um, we worked with uh, UW Health, um, which is formerly Swedish American Hospital. And essentially what the students would do in this um, example would, they do a lot of pre-work and, and really uh, looking into the different careers that a hospital has. Um, sometimes we'd bring in speakers, sometimes we would um, do some uh, pre-investigation work on the different careers uh, before uh, attending UW Health. But um, the students would first get a tour of the hospital. And I, I mean, this is a full on, like we're going to multiple floors and checking out the different uh, facilities that they have. Um, this also uh, includes behind the scenes with their um, their biological lab, which was really interesting. The students almost in every case loved um, experiencing the lab because they could see kind of that behind the scenes. What are they doing? They're testing um, different um, uh, diseases and viruses that they have. And, and really th those kind of conversations with the professionals at the lab always stood out with the students. But um, in that tour, um, uh, they get to see um, a surgical room, they get to uh, see the, the ER and various places throughout, really experiencing the different careers that are going on throughout the hospital. Um, they also got to experience the EMT wing uh, where they do some of the training with their um, EM, EMT employees. So, um, but after the tour portion of the uh, uh, experience is the students are kind of pre-matched with three careers that um, they may have interest in. And so um, they may include, you know, nursing, surger, surgery with the techs and the surgeons, uh, some of the operations components of the hospital, the heart hospital, the ER, and they get to go to three of those um, different experiences. And so this is more of a intense kind of uh, discussion with the people that work in those areas. What do they do on a day-to-day -day basis? And uh, really just um, that, that intense interaction with those individuals. And then finally, at the end of the um, uh, experience, they bring in all those people together and host a panel. And that panel is where if, if I didn't get to go to the heart hospital or I didn't get to experience 
the lab uh, in a way that I wanted. I could ask more specific questions. Um, they, they also um, talk about a lot of the essential skills that are needed to work at a hospital, which I thought was really important um, because we were doing that work on essential skills with our students in class. And so when you have the professionals talking about that uh, to the students uh, on a face-to-face, -face, um, it really uh, lends them to the fact that this is what's expected in the industry. And so um, that intensive career development um, experience was one that students really um, love doing. Um, now, a, a specific call out to this experience is that it was only for the health sciences students. Um, the tour and the experience is sustained for multiple hours. There are multiple careers being investigated and a specific call out to some of the non-traditional careers um, that um, we sometimes forget about in the healthcare field, uh, like working in the lab, like um, you know, uh, testing for the biological components um, or the surgical tech uh, position, uh, which we felt was important because we know that all of our students aren't going to be doctors. All of our students aren't going to be at that highest tier. Um, and so uh, we wanted to give opportunities for students who maybe want to get started in the career as a CNA or a surgical tech or um, working in a, a biological lab. Um, just some recommendations if, if you're looking at a similar occurrence in your um, community. Um, we had to, uh, it requires an employee contact at the partner organization. We had to figure out that component. Um, uh, it took us a few months to figure out who was that really go-to person who could organize something like this at a hospital. Um, some considerations were that you wanted to do this either early in the school year or um, sometime in the later spring due to flu season is that hospitals have those um, kind of uh, restrictions um, that are more common now with, with what's happened with flu and, and COVID. Um, we really had to take into account the HIPAA uh, component and every student actually had to sign a HIPAA form uh, through the hospital that we were working with. And so um, that also included them not being able to bring their phones on the actual experience. So uh, we expected them to, to dress professionally, um, come prepared with questions, and uh, really follow up with them on a, a student-driven reflection, which made the um, experience an intense experience for them. So I'm going to kick this over to Heather to talk to you uh, about the human and public uh, services um, experience. Sure. I know that there are quite a few uh, around the state, what they call like a future educator conference, where the, the students are going for the day to that university, uh, to a community college sometimes as well. Uh, and they are having um, sessions and uh, opportunities to learn all about uh, education and the multiple uh, careers that are in education as well. Um, I personally have taken some of the students to, um, when I was counselor in Pena, I took them to um, ISU in order to, I know that Jason has, uh, they have at NIU, there are multiples coming up actually for those students to come in. It is a day dedicated to education and the education careers. Um, so you have presentations, sessions, what it means to be a teacher, um, and as well as panels and so forth, where the students are are clearly clearly having conversations regarding education. Uh, I know that. Oh, yep, there we go with the with the numerous avenues in, in entering education, what it could lead to, um, everything from the the paraprofessional um, to the the teachers to the professors to educational research, which is one that is often um, overlooked, and what type of careers you may have in that. Um, so it's just a wonder op wonderful opportunity for the students to find out um, everything there is to know about education, something that we are all very <laughs> passionate about. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, not every post-secondary partner has the capacity to offer this same experience. So I, I echo this uh, slide very much. So start small, find a contact, 
um, and someone that's able to work with your district. Uh, work with um, area districts to create this. Uh, you can have a regional approach on this. Um, uh, I think that that's very important or with an EFE, um, especially when we move into some of these other areas as well. I'm seeing a lot of that um, happening with, with uh, regional approaches to, to offering these types of experience for the students that are very career specific. Yeah, and um, I, I've done one of these also with a local university. And actually, we had two um, colleges that offered two kind of different experiences. But um, I think what is um, really great was that each one of them kind of focused in on their programs as well, which I thought was um, nice because the students that attended both of them could see, hey, like, I really liked this experience um, because this was the one that focused more on um, the type of education I wanted to, to, to work on. And so um, I think that was something that was especially um, awesome for them to experience because um, it may, it helped their decision in, in uh, choosing a college that they wanted to go to that had a special focus area for them. Mm -hmm. So our third um, experience is one that I know is currently happening around the state in multiple regions. And the reason I know that is because I've had people uh, reach out and, and talk about the ones that they're doing. I've seen some on Facebook uh, from, from different people I'm following throughout the state. And, and so this one is really based on the manufacturing, engineering, and technology and trades uh, pathway. Um, and this one is, is known as like the annual building trades expo. And so uh, really this is where multiple labor organizations and contractors partner with the school to produce a more in-depth experience for their students. Um, it meets those requirements that we talked about. It's multiple hours long. It's specific to the manufacturing, engineering, technology, and trades career pathway. Um, and it allows students to have that um, intense interaction uh, with the uh, workers in those fields. So some examples that come up is we had our local painters um, who were who were doing sessions of you know what do they actually have to do pre-painting wise but also what do they have to do um, while they're painting and, and some of the strokes that they're doing and so they're literally taking the kids you know handing them a paintbrush and saying hey practice these certain strokes on how you would um, you know take on this project and so the kids are getting kind of their hands dirty in this work they're experiencing it, um, you know, same thing with the cement mason um, uh, guys in, in the unions as they're sitting down showing the kids how they're using the trowels. Um, the steel workers are actually getting the kids up onto a, a steel beam. And it's kind of like, you know, like they would be in a skyscraper setting, right? Except for they're only um, a few feet above the ground that they could step off of it. Um, but they're, they're practicing their balance and also um, being put into their um, their uh, protection as they're you know being strapped in and they're working on some steel work, uh, putting some beams together. And so it's really a great experience for them because um, you know having the understanding of like this is what I'm going to do every single day and uh, be working with my hands and and continuously. Um, being up at a height that, you know, maybe this is only two feet high and it's safe here, but in the real world, we're going to be hundreds of feet in the air. And so um, th these are some of the common practices that take place at these annual building trades expos. And how do we know they're intensive? Well, you know, in the ones that I've attended, you know, the kids have the goggles on, they have the hard hats, they're, they're getting their hands um, into the work. Um, they're having the the intense conversations with these guys, you know, and 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 these guys, you know, they talk like they do on, while they're on the job. And so, uh, for some students, it's eye opening to see how they even talk to each other um, because that's just how they are on those jobs, and and really being um, focusing on safety as well. And so, anytime something that is like kind of quote unquote unsafe, the guys are very quick to. Um, uh, take on that issue because obviously safety is their number one uh, issue on these types of uh, careers. 
And so some of the accomplishments of the uh, manufacturing, engineering, technology, and trades experience are it connects students to the local unions uh, and the contractors who are in desperate need of these workers. Um, it also exposes them to a host of careers uh, collectively. Um, and so um, here you, you, you might have 30 different careers that you're exposing students to that maybe they just weren't thinking about in, in the trades. Um, and then when, when done intentionally, they oftentimes have women and minorities represented at these um, uh, experiences. Um, I know from a perspective of some of the kids that we bring, you know, seeing someone of the same gender or race and like interacting with them and saying, oh, like I didn't know, like, you know, women were in this kind of field. Um, that experience for some of the young women is, is one that you just see them smiling afterwards and saying, I want to do that too. And so it really addresses that need for uh, minority groups to be in the trades as well. So I, it looks like we're getting some questions in the uh, chat also, uh, but if you have questions or comments on the intensive career exploration development, um, it looks here, Brian says, how are the future educator conferences being promoted? Um, Jason, I, I'm gonna give you that one for the uh, NIU one. Yeah, on the NIU side, as I just put in the chat, we, um, uh, we, we don't, we don't promote them as like, hey, here's a day, sign up for this day. We develop them uh, in partnership uh, with, again, either EFEs or ROEs, or both actually. Um, so if there's an interest in the part of an EFE region of setting one up, um, that's actually something that uh, you could reach out to me and my team on the College of Ed side for, um, I will try and drop in uh, a couple of email addresses on that in just a moment when I'm done talking, um, we'd be happy to do that. And then like ISU, of course, has a different approach as Heather said, and as Dan put in the chat, they, you know, they say, hey, here's our future educators conference day. Here's the link, sign up. And so hopefully this mix of options, um, and, and I, I do want to call it, Heather did also bring up, we know community colleges are, are doing this kind of work as well. And so, um, um, and with our student schedules, I, our high school students are busy. Um, it may be a mix. I mean, I could see a school district participating in in two different things potentially. Certainly, in at least in our education space. Well, and and in other spaces. I mean, Bill's got. Um, he had in the slide, what's happening regionally, for example, in manufacturing, engineering, technology, and trades. You may have multiple intensive exploration experiences that you're offering students during the year. You may have a handful of students who are able to participate in multiple of those, but in many cases, it may be these are, these are the students going to this one versus these are the students going to this one. And sometimes that could be just because of like what the day looks like. Like I can't go in the fall because I play X sport and I, I can't be late coming back uh, potentially for that. So anyhow, hopefully that helps answer that. And Heather, um, in your question, it says, what type of documentation from these events need to be added to a student portfolio? I think really that that's kind of up to, to your district um, in a sense is that that's not a, a requirement as I've seen. And so um, really kind of figuring out, you know, what, what do you have as a component of your portfolio um, in, in district is, is something that you guys would have to um, discuss within your, your own team. Correct. And I will say that when building the plans, when it comes to the description of the career uh, exploration activities, um, especially for those that are focused on a, on a career fair, um, I, I ask that you include that type of information as far as the opportunities for the students to have that reflection. So is that coming beforehand or, or afterwards um, and where that's going to take place just to provide additional evidence that those conversations are not just limited to the career fair, especially if it's one where there's multiple careers there, um, but they, they are truly uh, then guided towards um, narrowing down what that field is, which then could lead to that specific career pathway. And another great question from Anne, Anne, Anna Marie is, can anyone join the educators conference if we have interested students? I think it depends on the actual conference, uh, Anna Marie. So yes. um, 
And I see that Dan put the information in um, regarding the one at ISU. Yeah. Um, so you, can, if you just search for those, you can find them, and then the links and how to register and all of that, and and what the requirements parameters are for all of those. All right. Um... Uh, let's see. Heather says ISU is is full of this full. year. So yeah. Just FYI. So okay, so this is also um, for the education one. I think this is um, something that as you are investigating this this one example, right? This education one is see what um, some of the local community colleges are offering. Um, so I, I I know through um, a local community college where I was at. Um, they wanted to do something where students got uh, an experience to sit down with some of the professors. Um, they got to attend an actual education classroom. Um, they, they got to um, have lunch with the educator professionals. And so um, I think each one is a little bit different on how, on depending on what the actual college can offer and what kind of programs that they have as well. And so um, keeping that um, uh, cognizant of the work is that, you know, you may have a local community college or college or university that you're going to have to work with um, to to develop what that looks like for your kids. Um, but it could also be looking to um, the NIU or ISU or some of the larger universities to reach out to them directly and um, see how you can um, participate in one in the future. All right, <clears throat> so we're getting to the end here. Um, we just wanted to share some additional resources um, with you. The ISB College and Career Pathway Endorsement website is up. Heather's done a fantastic job of getting those resources up onto the website. Um, two specific call-outs is the CCP Academic Readiness resources that are over on the side tab. If you're looking at it, it would be over on this side of the web page. Um, if you click on that, you will, you'll, you will see them. Um, she also has the added list for the CCPE coordinators. Um, this is also where if you need have questions for Heather, she has the office hours listed. And so we just wanted to continue to talk about that. Heather, was there anything that I missed as a part of that um, component to um, the, the updates to the website? No, no, I don't think so. Okay. So as you're going um, today, if you could uh, fill out the evaluation form, um, you can click on that. Um, I'm gonna copy the link and, and throw it in here into the chat, but please go ahead and take the evaluation if you can uh, before you leave and we'll stay on um, and and just allow you to have time to finish that evaluation form. But if you have um, more specific questions, we could uh, stay on and, and possibly answer some of those as well.